Hey, hey. Here. Okay. Watch out. Set. Sold. On. The Kerbal Space Program. The pinnacle of Kerbin's technological advancements. The well-known and well-respected organization discovering the wonders of the Kerbal system and engineering and scientific betterments for all Kerbal kind. And so today, they are utilizing complex shuttlecraft to construct orbital space stations and so much more. And yet, so many of these advancements are due to the hard work and determination of four pioneering Kerbonauts. These are the stories of the brave explorers who dared to travel faster and higher than those who preceded them. The trailblazers, the first ones to leave the confines of Kerbin's atmosphere, the first ones to orbit the planet, and yes, even the first ones to set foot on another celestial body. The Kerbals who would defy the Kraken and touch the Mun. Officially, the program knew them as Kerbalnaut Group One but most of Kerbin knows them better as the Moho Four. They are the original four. Perhaps less well known than the others. He is the engineer in the group. This is the story of Bill Kerman. Even from an early age growing up near the mountains in a sparsely populated region of Kerbin, he was interested in engineering. His determination and diligent studying saw early dividends as he was accepted into college. At university, he continued his study of engineering. However, during the course of his post-secondary education, a global conflict broke out. So, before Bill finished his final year of schooling, he decided to join the Army Air Corps. The Army did not end up calling him to duty. So, Bill enlisted with the Navy to be a pilot. His initial and advanced training went smoothly, where, after completing his initial flight schooling, he was commissioned as a lieutenant. At first, he was assigned to fly cargo planes, but Bill longed for something more. A fighter unit was also stationed at his airbase. He then sought out the fighter squadron's commander, who indicated that he could apply for a transfer. The transfer went through. And shortly after, the squadron switched over to the newer fighter aircraft, the Corsair. The unit ended up stationed on a small atoll, then moved to some other small islands. During this time, Bill flew many combat missions in the area. He received many commendations for his service in the theater. After the war, he continued to fly Corsairs, even though he was transferred to several different bases during this time. He would also work to become a flight instructor, and soon after, was promoted to major. While Bill was serving in the Navy, a new conflict broke out. In a localized region of Kerbin, the Cold War went hot. Before he was deployed to the region, seeing that the Air Force had just received a new fighter called the Sabre, Bill applied for an inter-service transfer. Bill arrived in theater before his transfer went through. While he waited, he flew fighter bomber missions and received the nickname Magnadas because of all the enemy fire that would hit his plane. In total, Bill flew 63 combat missions most of them flying very low, providing close air support for those fighting on the ground. A couple of times, Bill returned to base with more than 200 holes shot into his plane. A fellow pilot described him as absolutely fearless, the best I ever saw. It was an honor to fly with him. Eventually, his transfer would go through, where he would go on to fly an additional 27 combat sorties in the Sabre. Bill was assigned to patrol an area known as MiG Alley. The MiGs were formidable fighter jets. Recalling this time, Bill wrote, since the early days of the first Kerbin conflict, pilots have viewed air-to-air -air combat as the ultimate test, not only of their machines, but of their own personal determination and flying skills. I was no exception. Bill longed to be an ace. His Air Force companions gave him the call sign, MiG Mad Marine. Eventually, Bill would get his chance to engage a MiG. A few days before his birthday, he shot down an enemy in a dogfight. A few days later, he shot down a couple more for a total of three victories. Then, less than a week later, the war came to an end. After the war, Bill made the transition from being a fighter pilot to a test pilot. He left the theater for his next assignment at the Naval Test Pilot School. There, he continued his studies in physics and mathematics. His first test flight was for a new variant of the Sabre, 
called the Fury. The Navy was interested in having their own version of the jet designed specifically for carrier operations. This flight, however, would end up being one of the most dangerous of his career. The cockpit depressurized, and his oxygen system failed, nearly killing him. The experience left him just a little more apprehensive and cautious, although he would continue to push boundaries, testing aircraft to their limits. For a while, he would be assigned to the Bureau of Aeronautics, but he hated his desk job. So when given the opportunity to test out the capabilities of a new fighter jet, he made the most of it. He calculated that this plane could break the record for the fastest transcontinental flight. So he nicknamed his little mission Project Bullet, as his plane could fly faster than a bullet. During the flight, he flew across the entire continent with an average speed faster than the speed of sound. This even includes the time spent during mid-air refueling when he had to slow down below 480 kilometers an hour, thus putting his name in the record books. For his accomplishment, he would be awarded another medal and a promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. The flight made him a small celebrity, but alas, he was getting up in age for a military pilot. He was going to have to make a career change. Through his job at the Bureau of Aeronautics, he found out about an opportunity to work for the Kerbal Space Center. Bill had been fascinated with space and the tests being conducted at the KSC. So, when his bureau was asked to send a pilot as a test subject for G-force experiments in a centrifuge, Bill quickly volunteered for the job. And because of his extensive experience as a pilot, engineers at the KSC began to consult him as they made designs for the very first spacecraft. At this time, the president made a request for the KSC to recruit its first Kerbonauts from among the ranks of military test pilots. About 100 candidates then were found meeting the minimum requirements. This included Bill, although he was at the upper limit for both age and weight. Although he was on the edge for the requirements, Bill's commanding officer at the test pilot school made a special trip to the KSC to implore them that Bill is exactly who they need. During an interview with the director for Project MOHO, Bill took with him the results of his centrifuge test, a test that he had done well at and that maybe very few other candidates had even taken. The director also noted how Bill stayed late to study designs for the Mark I command pod. Thus, he made the first cut, but he would still need to endure even more difficult physical and psychological testing. Now his desk job at the Bureau of Aeronautics was paying dividends. Bill was already a part of Project MOHO. The selection committee noted that Bill had strength of personality and dedication. Therefore, he made the cut as one of the final four. The other three were Jebediah, Bob, and Valentina. It was noted that all four had the right stuff. But Bill had one of the hottest records as a pilot, was the most quotable, and seemed to be the most photogenic. But the gravity of the demands ahead became quickly apparent. As the four watched a rocket launch at the KSC, the rocket exploded shortly after takeoff. Bob then turned to Bill and remarked, Well, I'm glad they got that out of the way. Bill was the backup for both Jebediah and Bob's Moho Redstone flights. Both of those flights were suborbital missions. Bill was selected to fly the first Moho Atlas mission. This was to be the first orbital mission. In honor of the occasion, Bill named his capsule Friendship 7 and even painted that on the side like one of his fighter jets. Due to a series of postponements, Bill ended up being able to spend extra time in his capsule and the simulator. He racked up over 85 hours performing simulations and tests. Even on the launch day, there were 11 delays, but eventually Bill was able to lift off from the Kerbal Space Center after waiting more than three hours in the capsule. Godspeed, Bill Kerman. As the flight passed through Max Q, Bill reported, Have some vibration area coming up here now. Fortunately, the booster separation and the engine performance were all going according to plan. The craft continued to tilt over through its gravity turn. This gave Bill his first view of the horizon. Bill remarks that this is a beautiful sight, looking eastward across the ocean. The booster had been performing almost perfectly for the duration of the entire flight. 
it continued to accelerate the craft to a high enough altitude that Bill could enter into a stable orbit. As his booster section cut off, telemetry data showed that the craft was only 2.1 meters per second below nominal. Bill and his friendship 7 have done it. They are in orbit. As Bill passed over the next continent, he described seeing what looked like a dust storm. Controllers on the ground said, yes, it is quite windy here. There had been some issues with the craft spinning unintentionally. Bill had to be careful as his capsule had a very limited electrical supply and he had to make sure there'd be enough to orient his craft during re-entry. Later in the flight, telemetry data indicated that his heat shield had loosened. If this was correct, Bill could be in a lot of trouble. So controllers on the ground recommended that Bill not decouple his upper stage right away. This order confused Bill since the controllers did not say anything to him about the heat shield. Nonetheless, Bill complied with the order and ended up being able to see the upper stage burn up in the atmosphere. After the flight, it was determined that it was just the sensor that was faulty. Bill would end up landing just southeast of the space center. Bill would later go on to describe the mission as the best day of his life. This is Echo 3. Thanks for joining me to discuss Bill Kerman. I will see you next time.